Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming here today. I know that it's 5.30, uh, the first day of reInvent. All your colleagues are probably at happy hour right now, so we appreciate you being here with us instead. Uh, this is FSI 317, Trading Up, Fidelity Investments Takes Trading to the Cloud. My name is Jeremiah O'Connor. I'm a principal solution architect for AWS. I've been working with the Fidelity folks on stage for about the last four years now, helping them in their AWS journey. So I'm going to be joined today by Lou Mancini, who is head of equity, options, and technology for Fidelity Investments. I'm also joined on stage with uh, Amr Abdel Halem, who is the head of cloud platforms at Fidelity Investments. So we've got a very useful agenda here today. So the first topic we're going to get into is we're going to talk about Fidelity's order management system. Then we're going to segue into the roadmap and challenges that they had migrating this order management system to AWS and really getting this um, uh, very latency-sensitive application running on AWS. Then we're going to dive into the actual architecture itself. So we're going to dive into what AWS components comprise this architecture for this application. Then we're going to kick it over to Amr, who's going to talk a little bit about platform resiliency, so the stuff under the hood that this application actually runs on. And then finally, we're going to wrap it all up with um, sort of an overview of Fidelity's cloud platforms and how they work today. So with that, I'll pass it over to Lou, who's going to talk a little bit about the order management system. Thanks, Jeremiah. So my name is Lou Mancini. Um, I run equity and options trading technology at Fidelity Investments. And in the last few years, we have begun the modernization of our trading stack at Fidelity. The trading landscape in the last few years has heavily changed, as I'm sure many of you are aware. We've gone from, <clears throat> we've gone from building out older systems to having a need to be able to scale to a much larger extent and be able to, to uh, process much larger volumes of data in our systems to be able to handle the ever-increasing amount of volume that's coming in from both our retail traders and our institutional traders. This project has begun in 2019, and today we have it running in production, and I'm going to take you through how we went about that journey, what the reasons we did for that to build that system were, and what we've done in the future to get, what we plan on doing in the future to get to where we are. So let's talk about the reasons that we had to do, come up with to build this, right? We started seeing capacity constraints. As we said, up until about 2019, volumes were relatively consistent. We could kind of know about the max volumes that we were going to have based upon our number of clients and the amount of accounts that we were seeing. Into 2019, things drastically changed, which I'm going to show in a couple of slides. There were also some other reasons, though, that we needed to actually go down this path, right? We needed to modernize our technology. Our technology was starting to get a little old. We've been building on top of mainframes and on top of x86 server architectures that have been in existence since the 90s. We also realized that we needed to have a large amount of savings in our terms of our uh, costs, right? When we look at the cloud, we believe that we could have some significant savings in both our hardware and licensing fees, real estate costs, and our ability to have to staff our data centers. Another key component that we realized as we started to begin this journey was speed to market. Speed to market was important in our ability to change things and get, those, um, get that type of um, quick to market um, new products was becoming ever more important, especially as people were trading more and we started to see much larger volumes. So let's talk about the impetus for this, right? Back in 2019, this is a graph, and this is one of my favorite graphs that probably of my career. You can see that this is the trading volumes that we saw at Fidelity Investments. In 2019, we had our historic high. And you could see from the little part on the graph what we saw up until then. And at that time, we thought that was a very large number. But then three things drastically changed in the trading space. We had fractional and notional trading that came about in terms of being able to trade portions of shares, which ended up allowing people to trade much more frequently. We had zero commissions, which also changed the trading landscape, right? You saw that all of a sudden that you can trade for zero dollars and it no longer became a barrier to trading for you to be able to execute and route an order. So instead of maybe trading one large lot of 100, you might have tried to trade three lots of uh, 33, 33, and 34. And then the last piece, of course, was the meme stocks. Right? The meme stocks hit in 2021. So to give an example, which you can see from what our historic peak in 2029, we are doing 4x our historic 2019 peak just in our average daily volumes today. And we are doing well over 5 to 6x 
um, in our uh, peak that we saw in the meme stocks. It was actually over 500% our original peak. And as most of you that are involved in trading would know, that's actually not even fully the, the whole story, right? What you really see is you see it in the first half hour, you see the vast majority of trades versus the actual entire day. So if you were to look at this, the actual, our ability to handle that volume needed to increase very significantly. And that's how this came about. We had taken our, this system live that we're gonna talk about right before that meme stock crisis. So let's talk about how we actually went about building these new systems. The first thing we had to do is we had to build out a development team capable of operating in the cloud, right? That's a very different paradigm than actually building out systems today running on-prem. We had to take our developers that were very familiar with trading systems and retrain them on how to operate in the cloud, to be prepared for every and anything to possibly fail, to understand availability zones and regions and make sure that we could transmit orders in a tier zero system at any time under any failure scenario. So what that means in fidelity terms is that even if we were to lose an availability zone or were to lose a region, we can seamlessly work on orders that were submitted in prior regions or new orders without a customer knowing about the outage. Some of the key things that we had to do is we started shortening release cycles, we did smaller builds, we did CICD pipelines, and we did the standard stuff. But some of the non-standard stuff that we had to do to special to trading is we had to build a custom chaos and performance testing framework that allowed us to actually build out and simulate market on open loads, 10x market loads from the original peak that you would see over there, and be able to simulate failures during any and all of these times in real time in an environment that is a mimic of production so that we can make sure that we're actually able to handle these trades and get these trades to the market in a very fast period of time. The reason for that, because unlike most systems, if a trade doesn't, if, if a system fails or part way through a transaction can be completed later, say like a credit card system, right? It can always be recharged five minutes or 10 minutes later once the, the, the system comes back. A trade can't, once we've accepted a trade, we need to get that trade to the market or else the price might move and the customer may be owed money on how to fix that trade from the price they should have gotten from the price they've gotten. So building out these chaos tools and these performance tools was very key to us being able to deliver a trading system on AWS with what our tier zero requirements of 24 by seven with 100% reliability. So let's talk about some of the challenges that we went through to get through and build what I just talked about. Some of the challenges in trading is, in trading, you have to interact with other parties, and you have to interact with older systems that give you data. Trading is not simply taking a trade, verifying you have enough money, and then sending it to um, a broker or an exchange to execute. That's a, the most simple form of it. But when we look at Fidelity and how we do trade, we service an enormous amount of business lines. Stock plan services for people that have blackout calendars. We, and in WI, which is our workplace investing, we have to make sure that we can do all sorts of different types of tradings, and we also need to make sure that we can handle complex order types. So we have to be able to integrate with legacy systems that are both on-prem, new systems that are in AWS, for teams that have already made the, the progress to AWS, and we have to be able to integrate with all of the existing trading framework around Wall Street. And most of the trades today, when you do a trade, is sent via, as many of you are aware, is called the FIX network. FIX is a protocol that is built 20-something years ago in the 90s. It was designed around servers that have you know, a disk attached to them, has heartbeats, and is not designed for a cloud where you need to have you know, storage that doesn't exactly exist on your server. So we had to solve by building custom fix engines that can actually operate in a Kubernetes environment, and we had to build custom frameworks to make sure that we could actually operate at a multiple thousands transactions per second as it would look like on a normal fix engine that you would see, and be able to transmit those orders to the market in a timely fashion. We also had to make sure that those fix engines could be able to operate multi-region, which was another hard concept that we had to get through, which I'll explain a little bit more later in some of the architecture diagrams. Some of the other pieces that we had to take into account is, as I said before, we had to do it in a multi-region setup. What does that mean? We need to make sure that if a customer is submitting an order, it could go to either region one or region two, and if anything was to happen to region one, a customer could act upon that order in region two, 
and be able to cancel or replace that order without actually knowing that the primary site that they sent that, that order to has failed. We also need to make sure that in, if we were to actually still have a single region, that we would be able to survive multiple availability zone failures as well. And we did this in a multiple different factors. We, used this, we did this by utilizing many of the services from Amazon, such as MSK and DynamoDB, which we'll show later in our dark architecture diagrams, as well as having to build a lot of custom toolkits to allow us to circuit break, be able to tell when something's go wrong, reroute orders that are in flight in case of an issue, detect failures, say, in underlying storage, and be able to actually work on orders in real time, triage them automatically via the system, and be able to make sure that they get to market in a real time. And if for some reason they don't, we can actually notify and have a corrected price for the customer. So this should all be invisible to the customer. Some other pieces that we had to deal with is the transition between public cloud and legacy. We have an enormous amount of data that's going through our legacy systems. It was impossible for us to actually just build a new system, which, is, which would actually be many systems, and just reroute everything to the new system in one day. So we've had to stand up a new system inside of AWS, as well as link it back to our old system that's actually currently today on-prem. And the way we've had to do that is we've had to forward bridge and backwards bridge data. And we'll go through that in the architectural diagram. And some of the key components to that, right, in a trading system here is unlike the traditional low latency trading systems that you would see in any of the other major broker dealers, we also have to support order inquiry in real time. Customers utilizing our Active Trader Pro platform or Fidelity.com need to know what the status of their order is immediately after it's submitted and immediately after it's been executed. That requires us to have the ability to serve those customers from either our old system our, or our new system independent of where we've actually sent that order to the marketplace. And of course, the last piece of the challenges that we've had to deal with, coming from an, an, uh, legacy systems, we're able to control our hardware changes. In the cloud, we cannot always control our hardware changes. And as a 24 by seven system, we need to be able to route away from changes if there are major changes happening, or be able to just absorb those changes in the trading day. That required a large amount of um, understanding from our developers to make sure that they can code and be able to absorb changes that happen intraday on these cloud-based systems. So let's talk a little bit about some of the technology we use to overcome some of the challenges that I just spoke about. One of the key pieces, we had to use data stores. Some of the data stores we used is DynamoDB, as well as we had to use some custom in-house cache systems, as well as a traditional RDBMS to satisfy some of the needs that we couldn't be satisfied in a standard key value pair system, such as Dynamo. Another really big key component is the logging and visibility. We had to build an entire framework around logging and visibility so that we could make sure that we could track a trade from when that trade is, begins and hits the system through every single component of the system in real time to make sure that that trade is actually executing and a problem hasn't occurred. So we have systems today that are actually going to listen to all the different pieces. So we will accept the trade, we will validate it, we will then begin the routing process, we will send it to an exchange, we will receive an acknowledgement, we will receive executions, and we will validate in real time to make sure that all of those processes are performing as they're supposed to. And if they're not performing as they're supposed to, we have circuit breakers that we've built into the system that will actually knock pieces of the system, whether it's a region, a pod in Kubernetes, or it's a region in the actual, uh, in AWS, a whole region, or it's an availability zone that will knock them out in real time in an automated fashion so that the customer is not impacted so we can triage or the system could automatically try and tr uh, correct itself any, any event that should occur that all of a sudden our trades are not going to the market in as timely fashion as necessary to provide the customer an execution that will give them the best price. Like I mentioned before, our enhanced test tools on top of just the standard test tools that we had to build for like unit testing, we had to build an entire custom chaos and performance framework for that. I mentioned that a little bit before, but let me go into a little bit more detail on that, right? We've built an entire replica that we can stand up and stand down at will of our production environment and have built replicas of our entire data sets at 1x, 2x, and up to 10x 
uh, or even more, of our maximum day, like I showed on that green graph at the beginning of the presentation. We are then able to replicate that environment, send data in, have a, an expectation of what we would see at our 99th, 99.9, .9, et cetera, time frame, and then we can inject automated faults in every part of the system that we can at least come up with that could fail to make sure that as those failures occur, we are able to actually respond in real time and be able to correct the system so that the customer will not be aware. And that goes from everything from the smallest Kubernetes pod to a large scale database failure to a failure of, our, uh, of an availability zone to an entire region failure. So we can fail in regions. And we're set up in a way that's hot, hot, which I'll explain a little bit later, but later in the diagram. But just as we mean, we can send order flow today to both regions at all times. So today, if you were to be sending orders on Fidelity.com and you were to be utilizing it, there is a roughly coin flip probability that you will be sending orders to either our new system or to our old system. And there's also another roughly coin flip probability that you will be going to, if you went to the new system, you would be going to the, one of the, prim, uh, the first region or the second region. There is no primary region. There's two regions that run in a hot, hot fashion, replicating in real time to each other. Some other pieces that we did that were a little bit more standard, we came up, we utilized mostly standard middleware um, and messaging packages. We used a lot of MSK from, from um, Amazon, managed service, and we also did a little bit of custom um, middleware messaging, like I mentioned before, where we had to build some custom fix engines and some custom underlying technology to make those work inside of a Kubernetes environment. And in terms of language, we used mostly standard Java languages, but we used a little smattering of everything else. So let's talk a little bit about our, order, our high level order architecture. The way we've structured this, as you can see, we have the gray diagram, which is our legacy systems, which will not only take orders in and orders and send them to the market. Our green systems are our new AWS systems, which will also take orders in and orders to the market. Both systems will also um, process our customer inquiry traffic, which can be very large. We serve and operate as a standard order management system for a lot of different customers. We have our own systems such as Active Trader Flow Pro and Fidelity.com, but there are many channels that, and other business lines inside Fidelity and outside of Fidelity in our, customer, uh, in our clearing business that utilize Fidelity's trading infrastructure. And all of them require the ability to know exactly where an order is, at what state that order is, and be able to act upon that order at any time. The key to what we did here is we wanted to make this invisible to the customer. So as you can see in the upper left, there's a box that's called director that runs on site. All trades and all inquiry statuses will go through director. Today, trades do, inquiry process statuses are almost complete. Director has the ability, based upon rules and circuit breaker knowledge, of where to route an order. Or should it go to the new system or should it go to the old system? What this does is it makes it invisible to the customer. We gave one API that's in front, so if someone's building out a new trading system and they need to connect to us, someone has an old trading system, they don't know if they're going to the new system. Because, and that allows us to migrate our flow piece by piece by piece, so as we build out new pieces of the system, we can continue to add functionality without customers needing to be tied to us to make sure that they make the appropriate changes and they are tied to us in releases we became independent of their releases. The other key component here, which I'll stress, is our ability to back bridge and forward bridge our data. We're in a hybrid mode right now, and, we will be in a, and we've been in a hybrid mode for two years, and we will be in a hybrid mode in multiple years coming until we complete this project. The ability for us to, to back bridge and forward bridge our data is another piece of the puzzle that allows it so that customers don't have to worry about where their inquiry or where their order goes. And if we were to move customers, it would be invisible. So our AWS system has a copy of all of our trading data that's going on in real time on our legacy systems. Our legacy systems have a copy of all of our trading data that's going on inside of our AWS systems. So that in the event of a customer inquiry, they can go to either system and get served their data. It also allows us a lot of freedom to release at a much faster rate. We don't have to necessarily, if we want to do a large release, we can scale volume down and scale volume up. If we want to add new functionality, we could add that new functionality and slowly get it 
uh, apply customers to it to make sure that we won't cause an outage or cause customer dissatisfaction. That's the key to how we've been building this. And that migration has allowed us to continue to, to go forward. So as you see in the picture, there's a forward bridge and a backwards bridge. We're real-time asynchronously replicating across both of them. Sure. It's very similar to a Strangler pattern, yes. It's not exactly, but it's, uh, it's basically a rule-based engine that underlying it has 50 different or whatever X amount of rules that there are that would compromise 100% of the order set, and then slowly we go click down one by one by one until eventually, hopefully, there is none. No problem. So let's go forward on our platform resiliency. This is one of the hardest pieces of the puzzle that we needed to solve when building something on Amazon, especially something that needed to be tier zero. We need to make sure that we could operate, as I said before, a multi-region, multi-availability zone pattern and be able to operate on orders that existed in either region at any time. So a couple of key decisions that we made at the beginning. All of our application logic is in Kubernetes. It is not in any sort of EC2 instances. There is no application logic, including our fix engines that are operating outside of Kubernetes. That allows us to be able to scale whenever we need to scale. It also allows us to add process so that the event of, say, we have another very, very large spike that is unforeseen due to some sort of market event, we can simply click a button and change our pod count from 20 to 50 based upon our built-up orders that we see overnight. One of the ways in trading that we can determine, especially in a, more of a, in a customer-facing system, is our overnight orders give us a guess as to what the probability of what we're going to see in the first 30 minutes. So unlike a traditional on-prem system where Someone's going to have to run and hopefully there'll be extra hardware lying around that we could set up. We never have to worry about that problem again. We literally just spin up a bunch more pods and we're ready to go with that particular point. Some of the other keys that we needed to do to make sure that this would work is we need to be able to fail over. And this was something that was very, very difficult for us to build. We need to be able to seamlessly within, multi within seconds fail over our entire fixed infrastructure from one region to another region. So if you trade a market order today it's very quick. It's going to execute or it's not going to execute immediately. Half of the orders, though, are not market orders. They're much more complex order types. Limit orders, GTCs, good to cancels, trailing stops. And they could exist for minutes, hours, days, weeks, months. Some can even go into the multi-month to even year time frame. We need to make sure that if those orders exist on exchanges, that a customer could actually operate on those orders, even in the event of a full failure of our entire region. So to be able to accomplish that task, we've built the functionality that we can, with the click of a button, be able to move our fix engines from the affected bad region to the good region and be able to take all of our customer flow from the director and point it only to a single region. We have actually, and this has been a, a, a very large benefit to us in production, so that we can actually go to a single region with minimal to no customer impact if any, and be able to actually be able to trade in that other region. That was a very difficult problem and one of the key pieces to how we built this system. So let me finish up with the last slide on where we are. So we go to the next slide. So where we are today. We began this journey about four years ago in 2019. We took it live on AWS somewhere around two years ago from the original POC that we did. You could see, these are real volumes here, as you could actually see, we've graphed them. Um, you could actually see in the red line here what our legacy system is processing, and it kind of matches a little to that green chart I showed at the beginning of the presentation. And in the blue line, what our um, new system is processing. And you could see that there have actually been days recently where we have actually processed more trades on our new system versus our old system. Over the next couple of years, coming years, we look to continue to do this for equities, and then we eventually look to scale this pattern to options, as well as many of our other different types of order types and business lines, so that we can complete the migration from our older on-premise on legacy systems to our new cloud-based systems. Thank you, everybody, for your time. I'm <laughs> Thanks. Amr is going to talk about the cloud component of it and what Fidelity did to build out their cloud architecture next, and then we'll take some questions. Thank you, Luke.
All right, so let me take like different spin for the story. Um, this is actually the first slide that we had in the presentation. I'm going just backward a little bit, like in, in want to talk about two dates here or two numbers here. The first one was uh, 2019, and that was Fidelity basically the announcement at uh, the CNCF, KubeCon at San Diego, our strategy to move to public cloud, multi-public cloud as first. And then like three years later, which is today, we're at 5,700 application running in the public cloud. So um, they all running in this platform, and in the next 20 minutes, I'm gonna do my best to tell you the story, how we build it, what is it today, what's our vision for tomorrow, and how we are hosting many, many applications that, you know, I actually I would love to like maybe interact with you guys. Can you guys raise your hand if you were using today Fidelity.com, Fidelity Mobile, Net Benefits, all of our Fidelity products? And if you look around you, like it's awesome. Like it's, uh, thank you for your business, thank you so much. And literally, you are interacting with this platform today. So um, this is a very interesting slide, actually. It does show like, you know, what was our vision, how we started that journey, and how we focus. When you scale 5,700 applications and more to come in that platform, you have to start, first of all, by building the foundation. This foundation has to be security foundation, your compliance foundation, your infrastructure foundations, where are you going to host your application, your data, your event streaming, all these components need to be in place. And I'm gonna go a little bit in deep about that in the next few slides. Also, you have to reimagine these applications. So Lou and his platform here is one of this. If you imagine, and since we talk about Kubernetes here and about containers, imagine like all of these platforms are running as clusters of containers. They're all running like ships or boats or carriers that carry these containers. We have massive number of them today. Some of them are criticality, like level tier zero, to tier one, to tier three, and so on. But that imagining of the application itself, that it will run encapsulated with your API, with your data, with your event streaming, with your observability and security, all encapsulated, that's one of the values that was added to this platform. And obviously, we work in investments, so we care about our numbers. The FinOps model, I'm gonna show a few slides about that, but the FinOps for us is critical it can get really expensive when you move this amount of applications to the cloud. How we manage that today and how we're continuing to manage that, that's gonna be one of the discussion we're gonna have here. And last but not least, we manage thousands of developers, hundreds of DevOps teams, many business units or business partners working with us around that. So um, we're definitely like focusing this year and next few years around the developer experience about having you know, and building our Fidelity open source project. We're gonna discuss that, show it to you guys as well, and how we are attracting the talent in the company. So um, just full disclaimer before I go on this slide, this is one way to build the platform. Uh, there's many other ways that can build this platform, but this way is bulletproof. We tried it, it did work. And in this slide, I wanna just share with you, like, you know, what is the rules? Rule number one that we used, we use an open source technology. We focus in containers, we focus in Kubernetes, we focus in many of the CNCF uh, product that we use today. We're using Envoy, we're actually part of the Envoy open source project itself. We're big in the telemetry side and open telemetry process as well. So that was one of the key strategies that we announced in 2019 at KubeCon. The second part was use managed services. So while Kubernetes is awesome, but we don't want to get busy managing Coop. As a matter of fact, we have a major private cloud in our data center today running Coop, and it's a big like, job and big task for operating that platforms. So definitely one of the recommendations I would say is to start using Coop, you know, managed services like EKS, and I'm gonna go a little bit in deep in how that we're using today, and imagine like hundreds and hundreds of clusters today, or this like container ships as well. Uh, number three, definitely you need to focus in you building your network strategy. So we literally, we have inside Fidelity similar like a map like this, you know, subway map. This is New York subway map. I couldn't share the right one that we have inside Fidelity, but we have a map that shows all the regions in all the cloud provider. It shows all the colors. It shows all of our data centers, the exchange, and the latency between all these areas. So Lou and his team and other product can literally see where I should place my applications, what is a sunny day via the rainy day, 
what is my, like, you know, like in New York, if you guys from New York area, you know there is express subway and local subway. When you're taking the express subway, and what happens when you have like this disaster and you have to go through a local, local subway? So the network is definitely one of the investment that we did. And since we start using managed services like EKS and MSK, we start focusing in building um, our Fidelity Kubernetes program or our container program on top of that. So we focus in the fleet management, how we manage these clusters, how we manage the multi-tendency, how we can host multiple application in these clusters. We also focus in the application management side, how we integrate our platform or applications with the security in the back ends, with observability, with other component. And last but not least, integrating that with the cloud services itself. Like you want to manage uh, your clusters and you want to manage your fleet from FinOps perspective, from resource management, you want to do that optimization. And our program focuses on that. On top of that, we start building all of our core and commons. So today, literally, we're more running um, our event streaming programs there. We're running our API program on top of that platform. We're running many other programs, including our future data programs itself is running on top of that platforms. And last but not least, obviously, Trade and Fidelity.com and others are running on top of that. Um, there is multiple ways you can manage like fleet of containers and Kubernetes. One way, you can buy a product. Second way, you can do like what we did three years ago. Go and assemble multiple open source projects and build our, your own project or build your own open source program. Or you can use ours. Ours is available, it's free, it's open source. We'll be very happy to collaborate with you. As a matter of fact, like, you know, a couple of banks already collaborating with us around that. And we'll love if you guys want to pre partner with us about it. Uh, just to give you, like, and highlight the program itself. Uh, the first piece is like how you can connect your fleet. So imagine you have a fleet of ships that are running your containers, and you want to have your thousands of developers access these platforms or these clusters and safely and understand what rule and what authentication authorization they can get in. That's what our K-Connect tool does. Uh, second one is our KRAN, and KRAN is uh, our framework that we build to manage these clusters to build all the operators and the integration that we have in these clusters and how we can safely upgrade this cluster. As a matter of fact, um, Kubernetes program itself and CNCF and AWS required an upgrade every three months. So you have to upgrade your environment every three months. We have requirement our rehydration as well that goes almost on a monthly basis. So with that program and with KNAN, we did manage over 12,000 upgrades in the last few years. And that's all happened seamlessly without you know, interference for the business. And you will need definitely a kind of like framework that will manage this infrastructure for you or in your behalf. Last but not least, we're very focused today in resiliency and operation. So we're actually releasing our Telev program and Telev is, um, is uh, meant for HOB. And it's a way of integrating our fleet of clusters or containers or Kubernetes with our Prometheus infrastructure that we're going to be launching in future and collecting all of this data and all of our data analytics for all our operational data in the back end. And we're building a framework where you actually can program diagnosing issues in your application or event issues. For instance, if you have an auto-scaling you know, event or you have a deployment event, it will do in your behalf, it will do the checkup that you ask it to do. And it will figure out where is the issues and the challenges and will provide you with some you know, solutions and hopefully in future to be intelligent enough by adding some machine learning ops model on top of that. But this is a future for us. Now, the real foundation under all of that is an EKS cluster. Our EKS clusters are very uh, systematic, meaning we provide like one single template for how the cluster are running for all of our applications and all our systems. Um, they have to run, as Lou is saying, in multi-regions, multiple availability zones, so they become rebuilt for all of our application team to use us. We also provide policies, like policies about how our routing is happening, how is our DNS service in the back end is being set up, how is our ALBs is being configured. All of that become or come rebuilt for all of our application team to host their application in.
that besides that, we actually do cluster management side or hosting or, or our, what we call the KRAN program itself. That's all become as well rebuilt. So when you deploy your application to our platform, you actually literally deploy your application, uh, reconfigure for observability, reconfigure for routing, reconfigure for security, reconfigure for FinOps, reconfigure for uh, east-west communication, and reconfigure for you know, additional tasks like you know, how we do the near services, the service discovery, and others, and futuristic actually how we're gonna do service mesh overall across all these clusters. Um, I mentioned the developer experience, and that's something actually we started this year. Um, what we found after like, releasing all these containers, today we have over a quarter million container running critical workload in production. And what we found that we need to start building this conversion or consolidation and unified our developer experience. Uh, today we have multiple projects working with that. This is one of them called the starting project. And the starting project is our application management platform. It very really focuses around like how you have unified experience when you board the application, how you can manage this multi tenancy in the back end, how you can integrate the teams to board the application, board multiple applications, how you can start like you know building prescriptive model uh, around deployment using some frameworks like you know Argos, CD, and other frameworks how you actually manage your cluster, so you can manage your upgrades, you can manage your hydration, and provide all of that through a single portal that can be self-service for all the teams and all the application teams and all of our DevOps teams as well, that you can manage that. Um, behind that, we actually have, and I have to recognize that and I have to mention this, this is Bombay, our sister group, and very focus in building this modern development cycle so before your application actually let, board to our platform and before our application can get inside the platform, you have to go through that pipeline. This is our, like, you know, um, I would say like one of the most like, you know, awesome programs that I saw for inner sourcing because it does collaborate all of our thousands of developers are they all collaborating in building that modern system. And that modern system actually, it does focus in the governance side, it does focus in building like consistency around the CI processes, around how this application is being built, around the test frameworks, around the security aspect of that, and it lasts by ending to production to where our cloud platform is and where is our application is being deployed there. Um, I wanna focus a little bit in the FinOps. There is actually one presentation there, it's awesome. You know, the presentation information is there. Uh, around the FinOps side, but um, I wanna go like through how we started the FinOps model in the cloud platform. Um, in, in day one, um, it's like when you buy a house, so you go like there and you're very excited about the new house, but then you get like hit by the first mortgage bill and be like, oh my God, like I have to worry about that and I have to manage that as well. So the first thing you do, you kind of like looking at refinancing information, like, you know, possibilities and probabilities, and that's what we did. So definitely like, you know, you wanna go through like, you know, a discussion about like using reserves instance and how you can do that with, uh, that will provide you like some kind of like, you know, um, definitely like, you know, cost management in this case. But the next time, the next one that you do after that, you start like looking in your rooms and you start seeing like lights on and you start like shutting down the lights behind your kids and everyone in the families, right? And we do that as well. We go like every weekend and every night and we see which system are being not used or underutilized and we do shut down this system in the back ends. And the next one you start like thinking about like why I don't put like an intelligent in our, you know, power system, why I start like using solar and using some of this like, you know, smart system and smart devices in the houses. And that's what we start doing as well in our side. So we start like utilizing the spot instance. And that was one of the things that we released about like two years ago. And in our management infrastructure, we were able to get up to like 40% of saving by using spots. Uh, about two months ago, we released Graphiton, and that's additional uh, saving that we're explain, gonna experience, and we're still like evaluating that right now. But we, we're expecting that might go as to additional 30% of the, you know, of cost saving as well in that. But I feel like, what is the most critical thing is really like, you know, application being developed toward uh, a financial 
aspect or like how you're, you can drive the culture inside your developing teams and your developing community to start thinking about like cost saving and start thinking about like how we can optimize the application itself, how we can use a smart autoscaler where the autoscaler will understand more than memory and CPUs. It will understand where the application is being utilized and how it can be like, you know, innocence will be reduced when you do this kind of things. And that's actually a futuristic thing that we're trying to do right now as well. Uh, I did speak about observability a little bit when I mentioned Telov, but this is one of the things that we're working on right now in our lab, and we're gonna be releasing that in massively across of all of our Fidelity uh, cloud platforms. And what we found around the observability side, it's very inter interesting because um, when you are in your data center, you're literally fine with having a traditional monitoring tools. But when you start building a hybrid model and hosting your application, part of your application on-premise, and the other part is moving to the cloud and moving from one region to another region and moving from one cloud to another cloud, and you start like, you know, deploy your monolith application toward like, you know, microservices. So one single app becomes like 30 or 40 microservices and you want to manage all this communication. What you find that the observability tool become more, have more noise, it's more expensive, and it's actually, it doesn't provide the MTTR that you're looking for. So one of the things that we're doing right now is start investing in building our observability pipeline. Uh, it's based on CNCF Omen telemetry. Uh, it was based its GA right now uh, for metrics and for traces. Uh, we're still working with them today around the log side as well. And I think this is one of the areas that we're gonna be, that could be our future for observability. Once we turn the pipeline on, this means we can remove most of these noises out of the observability. We will be able also to drive like the actual data or the critical data to our premium solution of observability and move the non-critical data to S3 storage or other solution that can be used in the back end. And using Telev and using the CNCF technology and Kubernetes, I think, and Prometheus and others, we'll be able to collect this data. Just you know, for example, uh, when you connect to an EBI server in Kube, you might be able to extract a thousand metrics per second out of your EBI server. Uh, this is by itself is very expensive if you're using like traditional cloud observability tools. But using that method, you'll be able to filter that and you'll be able to see which area, which metrics that you care about at certain time and you can program the other one to use them or not use them as well. Now, the data pattern is an interesting topic because <laughs> we started the data journey using our traditional RDBMS and you know, SQL databases. And, and Lou mentioned that like, as well in the first section of the presentation. Uh, what we found that uh, while they work well inside our data center, but when you move in the cloud side, you have to worry about failures and you have to worry about synchronization between multi-regions and between six availability zones for tier zero application like Lose app. And with that, we have to start investing in like a newer pattern. This is one of the patterns that we're invested in today using DynamoDB, so it's used as a caching layer in front of our RDBMS database in the back end, and it does hot, hot synchronization between the two regions. That's how we guarantee that, that the order or the failure in one of the region and the failure in one of the availability zones um, can be recovered in the right SLAs when we have the data synchronization happening almost near time. Um, and I, I want to end it at its great journey in the last three years. I think, you know, we use multiple like newer technology. We had a lot of tries, but what really mattered was the fidelity culture. Um, having these four pillars between security, between the platform, between the SRE, between the applications, having harmony between the four, collaboration between the four pillars, uh, that's actually what made our platform successful. Uh, we chat. We argue, <laughs> we discuss, we change plans. But at the end of the day, having these four pillars integrated and collaborating together, 
understanding that it's not like a traditional data center, no traditional races that can solve the problem. And instead, like every team is worried and every team is focused on what the other team is doing. Security team is helping the platform team. Our platform team is for, you know, focusing on SRE. Our SRE team is helping in engineering. Our application team is everywhere helping us with that. That's what matters. That's what the fidelity culture, the, the cloud platform culture is about. And I think that's why we're successful today in moving 5,700 applications to the cloud. And thank you so much for that. All right, thank you, Amr. Um, so I promised we will, live, uh, we will leave room, I should say, for, cust for questions from the audience. I do have one question, though, for Lou. I'm gonna flip back to this architecture slide real quick, because I think there's some interesting uh, data points here that I wanna discuss real quick. Let me find it. So Lou, um, earlier on in your presentation, you were talking about orders queuing up, right? So I'm a Fidelity.com customer. I wanna buy, let's say I've got diamond hands. I wanna buy some game stock, stop. I submit it overnight. These orders get queued for this system. So obviously you wanna maintain constant and low latency performance for all of your customers, whether they submit trades in the morning or whether they submit them at 2 p.m. when it's, there's not so much traffic on here. Mm -hmm. So how does this architecture allow you to maintain low and you know, consistent latency through, throughout the end-to-end -end transaction from the time I submit a trade order to the time it gets routed to an exchange. Sure, so that takes us back to the observability pattern which we were talking about earlier. We have a system today that is actually monitoring all of the different subsystems that you actually see in this diagram. It's monitoring from our fix engines to our components for routing to our order management piece from where the order is placed all the way to all the different steps it needs to make it to the exchange. We pre-allocate for the open based upon the overnight to make sure that we will have enough that no matter what we hit based upon a certain ratio, that we can always handle our overnight volumes at a relatively quick pace as when they execute at the market on open cross. And then, based upon that, we will make know that we have enough capacity in each one of these systems to make sure that each one of them can handle on a single region what both regions would be, could handle across the entire uh, day. So let me break that down a little bit. We have at least 2x per region, at least, to be able to handle what our theoretical max is for that day. So if, say, region 1 goes down and region 2 is there, region 2 can handle all of region 1's theoretical highest max and all of region 2's theoretical highest max and be able to monitor each one of the different pieces of the system as the day goes on. And we can be alerted and the system can automatically route around different pieces of it, say an availability zone and system in region 1 goes down. Or if the system can't route around it, we can take action to route around different pieces. We also have an entire system that we built on top of this that allows what we call an order room to actually monitor the orders in real time to make sure that execution prices coming back are where they're supposed to be. And in the event that they're not, can correct them and make sure that we are routing appropriately to those specific venues. Because sometimes what will actually happen is you may not actually have an issue with the system, but you might have an actual issue with one of the venues that's actually executing our trades. And that venue may start providing executions that are delayed, may take a while and start my queuing orders back up. We need to also monitor and route around those venues. So we've had to build stuff around that to make sure that we could have a consistent time to market for our customers and make sure that they can get those trades there on time. Gotcha. Thank you. That is all the time we have. We may be around to answer any follow-up questions that anyone has. Uh, thank you so much for coming to this session. We have our emails up here and then please feel free to rate the survey as well. Thank you very much.